Hello, it's David Thompson from the Cane Marketing Association. This is uh, the third in our series of uh, interviews around marketing to millennials for the not-for-profit group. Today, we're uh, very honored to have Max Valakut of Ben, Sim, and Brian, um, who has worked in a number of uh, roles dealing with uh, youth and, and now millennials. The founder of Youthography, uh, a, a name or a company that I think if you've worked in this space, you, you've heard of before. And now he's the managing director. He's also worked uh, and spoken uh, before on uh, CBC Radio, uh, Radio's Day 6. Uh, was a host of a television show on TV Ontario. Uh, my goodness, it's a long list. Max, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, as I said, we're talking about millennials and within the not-for-profit sector. Um, it's a question that, that comes up because I think this is a group that is... Uh, perhaps misunderstood, and a lot of the not-for-profits just aren't sure how to approach this this segment. Should they uh, talk to them now? Um, do they wait until they are at a, an older age, you know, closer to the typical demographic that not-for-profits target in the marketing? Um, you know, what we do know from research is that this particular age group is is quite involved. Um, that same research, however, shows that the uh, kind of donation amount is, is different. It's, it's not high. It's not as high as, as their, their core demographic. So, you know, when, when the uh, not-for-profit uh, council is sitting down with some of their colleagues, this is a question that pops up often is what the heck to do with these folks. So very honored to have someone with your uh, uh, experience in this area uh, to, to take a crack at answering some of the questions for these folks. So maybe I should start with what what are kind of the key trends that you see in your work uh, around engaging millennials? Well, the largest single trend over the past, oh, I don't know, let's say 10 or 15 years that we've actually been referring to millennials by that name, yeah. probably 10 years even, is that they're starting to be considered, or they have been considered, uh, a market entirely of their own in virtually every category. So for the longest time, we didn't really engage with young people as a separate market in very many categories at all. Mm -hmm. uh, things that were sort of extremely pop culture driven or extremely trendy or fashion driven um, uh, were perhaps directed at them, as well as uh, versions of, of, of toys, essentially, for teenagers and young adults. But we didn't think about them as being a separate market of their own in any category above that. If anything, we still tended to think that in more adult categories, we had to go through their parents to actually connect to them. Right. And the massive change over the course of the past 10 years, 15 years, is we now view this group as a market entirely of their own in essentially every category that exists out there, every industry, every category, everything. Yeah. So the not-for-profit area would have been um, an area where in the past we simply wouldn't have ever even thought about engaging with this group. And now we absolutely do. We recognize that there are things that make them different from their parents and different from, from adults, and we also recognize that in some categories, adults still have more influence on them than they do in any other. But fundamentally, we actually view them as being a viable or worthwhile market all on their own, deserving of uh, their own communications objectives and their own marketing campaigns or communication campaigns to, to properly connect with them. That is the single largest difference. So the, are you saying that in the past there weren't kind of concerted efforts at, at youths? period, or this is just a more concerted or concentrated effort towards a kind of a younger demographic that just in, in terms of its scope uh, and investment just hasn't been seen before? It's, it's both. In hmm. not-for-profit in particular, mm -hmm. though, the, there were very few efforts at engaging this group at all. Okay. In fact, um, the way most not-for-profit brands, most, not all, but most not-for-profit brands, uh, really pushed themselves as it was actually in a very adult fashion. Huh. It probably wasn't until the late 80s and early 90s, where Generation X was the age that millennials are, are essentially now, where we started to see the beginning of some uh, extremely youthfully oriented not-for-profit brands that actually directed themselves just towards this market. Amnesty International, in a lot of ways, started it all off with uh, some very impressive work in um, and regular work in, in how they engaged uh, music and musicians to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to to connect to this market. But that nonetheless was a not-for-profit that, that had a much broader mandate of who they were trying to have an impact on as opposed to simply that age group. Okay. In the 90s, finally, we had the beginning of the War Child Charity, which, uh, uh, again, really sort of pushed itself at, at, um, at, at, at the time, we would have said sort of, you know, the very, uh, the very tail end of Generation X or the very the very, very beginning of, 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 of millennials. And now, uh, 
there's been sort of a model of uh, a model established of trying to to view this group as, as not just deserving of necessarily their communications campaigns, but sometimes even their own not not for profit organizations entirely. Hmm. Uh, the work the Kielbergers have done with Free the Children and mm-hmm. how they turn that into Me to We Day, it's very, very, very millennially driven, I would argue, with adults, if anything, as a kind of secondary market. Hmm. So it, it, that simply wouldn't have been the case 30 or 40 years ago, okay. and uh, it, it, it's been slow to happen. So that now, um, if you're interested, for instance, in the fight against breast cancer. Well, you can uh, deal with the, the run for the cure if you want to, which sort of has a very broad target group of anybody. Mm-hmm. But if you're uh, a young sort of urban person who likes to go to really cool events and, and, and support your charities that way, you can deal with recent breast cancer, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, very much has a, um, has a way of operating and a way of engaging uh, their donors and their constituents uh, in, a, in an incredibly modern, incredibly useful way. Okay. So we're now actually seeing that that in not for profit, the categories themselves, the, the 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 charitable causes themselves, are going to get I think increasingly splintered. So that if you are engaged in a particular issue, but the charity feels old or staid or a little too adult for you, you don't actually have to not be engaged in that issue anymore because it doesn't make sense for you. You yeah. can actually find a way to go and get engaged on your own. Okay. So- um, so the Canfar folks, is another another wonderful example yeah. of that, for instance, where they have a young person's council, mm-hmm. and we're seeing more and more of that, where there's an adult version of uh, of the not for profit, and there may be a more millennial or youthful version of it as well. Okay. Um, so 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 two things: if it's been under ten or fifteen years, and you just uh, rifled off a couple of good examples, or examples I think of not for profits who are doing good work uh, in targeting millennials. This next question, you know. It, Perhaps it shouldn't be here, but it is because I think that there are still misperceptions about how to market to this group. So can you walk us through some of the misperceptions that marketers um, um, you know, should, should think as myths that, that are dispelled so that they can market better to this segment? So again, what are the biggest misperceptions of marketing to millennials that companies and not-for-profits not still have? Well, the number one most important thing is that while the group... Um, you know, does demand a kind of language, a marketing or communications language of their own. It is really important to understand that uh, sort of feeling millennially is often uh, the biggest enemy of doing good millennial marketing. So if you um, if you have a communications brief and uh, you've written the word cool anywhere yeah. in it, uh, <laughs> you, you need to strike that word off 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 of that brief. It's, it's, it's very important that rather than starting from the target market and working your way out, like with any other group, you start with your communications objectives and what you're trying to do, and then you make sure that it makes sense for your market. But the worst millennial marketing, either in the not-for-profit side or mm-hmm. in the for-profit side, frankly, always ends up feeling like um, a bunch of adults think they understand what young people are all about mm-hmm. uh, and end up producing terrible, terrible stuff because mm-hmm. of it. So it's very important that for this group in particular, uh, the words we always use are for youth by youth, mm-hmm. which is that everything marketed towards them should feel like it's for them, but also should feel like it's from them. And it doesn't. It's actually one of the ways in which not for profit and and uh, every other um, part of you know every, every other part of our marketing world have a ton in common. Mm-hmm. It's that good millennial marketing doesn't feel um, yeah. like it like yeah. it was created by a bunch of adults who are uh, you know. Um, Going online and reading a few blogs, and then thinking that they're 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 making what they need to, what, what they think the target wants. Okay. Um, then how do you see these successful uh, millennial marketers shifting, or how do they use uh, media differently to reach um, this group different from the folks who are not doing a good job? Uh, probably the the most important development of the past five or six years has been the overwhelming importance of social Mm -hmm. uh, um, in the media mix for young people. So uh, good millennial marketers now make sure that they have a community manager on staff Mm -hmm. and that they are producing um, relevant content and information that uh, that comes to young people in their social environments. You need to have a Facebook strategy. You need to have a Twitter strategy. It's conceivable that you need an Instagram strategy or a Pinterest strategy or a Foursquare strategy, depending on on what your brand is. But but having a strong presence in social matters tremendously, yeah. uh, and still matters more for this age group than for any other. Hmm. 
and respecting that their social media is not simply a marketing channel is therefore mm-hmm. incredibly important. Mm-hmm. It's where they spend an enormous amount of their time. It's where they connect to everybody in their network, their schools, their homes, their businesses, and most importantly, their friends. So it's important to realize that this is not like uh, television or print where uh, it's, it's um, expected that there will be sort of a break for advertising uh, and that, that um, the tone of, of our communications can exist independently of the tone of anything else. What's really important in this situation is that you recognize that you are sending out a message to where someone gets their um, a status update from their best friend and where their favorite band announces that they're going to be on tour and where their favorite mm-hmm. um, and when where uh, where their members of, of, of groups that represent their social interests or hobbies uh, where they're discussing their favorite movies it, it means that that fundamentally we have to be more engaging mm-hmm. because you're no longer just competing against not other not-for-profits for their attention you're actually competing against everything they ever yeah. look at everything they ever see and everything they're ever interested in and I think what I'm hearing, Max, is that you're not necessarily suggesting this is a place that they go to market, but this is a place where they go to engage in conversation. Yes, I you know I will say though that that um, it, while that is generally true, it yeah. can also actually be a um, a little bit of a uh, it can be a little bit of a red herring for some marketers who who tend to think that that means that they always want to have a conversation Mm -hmm. with everybody, with every brand about everything. The truth is, is that, yeah, it is where they tend to engage in conversations. There's absolutely no question. Mm -hmm. But we all need to understand that the fact that they do that doesn't mean that they necessarily want to have a a conversation with you. And so if you look at the amount of time a typical young person spends on, let's just say, Facebook and Twitter and the amount of engagement that uh, uh, that, that they expect, it varies wildly uh, across um, different areas. You want to be talking to your friends a lot and hearing what they have to say. You don't necessarily want hugely regular updates from a brand. Yeah, it actually yeah. might be the exact opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, okay, so which is a good lead into to my next question. You mentioned earlier on that or, you know, someone who's doing some good work like me, do we, can you give us in, in your expert opinion two or three are kind of the best in the not-for-profit in terms of marketing to millennials and work, work that you've seen recently? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, um, uh, there, you know, there's a lot to talk about. My, I, I, I'd actually like to sort of go back to me to we just for a second. Yeah. I think it's actually, um, uh, in many ways, it's actually the best example of, or, or maybe, sorry, the most dramatic example of um, something that, you know, didn't exist 25 years ago that was started by a young person uh, and that has continued to, to be successful and to flourish um, and yet uh, doesn't really obey a lot of the rules of a typical not-for-profit. So, you know, when Craig um, started Free the Children and then brought in his, his, his brother to, to be a part of it, it was crazy to think that a 10-year-old might conceivably actually be inventing uh, <laughs> uh, his, his, own, his own not-for-profit. So uh, I like to always go back to that one simply because absolutely all the rules of how uh, an NFP should be developed and who should be starting it and how it should work. Absolutely yeah. all, all those rules were broken, Yeah, which uh, I think is, um, uh, you know, absolutely bears, you know, bears repeating. And the fact that he's um, managed to turn it into a much larger organization where, you know, they have columns in newspapers mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and huge conferences or massive event days that bring in you know, huge worldwide speakers to talk about sort of youth engagement and how the world is changing, I think that's actually uh, uh, extremely, extremely impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I love the sort of, um, how can I put it, game-changingness of mm-hmm. it. Um, it. What I tend to like personally lately is stuff that feels like it was not overwhelmingly expensive to produce but uh, for millennials, but nonetheless um, managed to as the expression goes, it's a terrible thing to repeat, but manages to quote unquote go viral. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, stuff that in the past would have been almost impossible to get out to a large group of people without a huge amount of money for media dollars. And now actually has done a, um, a better job. Uh, and, and now actually the kind of stuff that gets out there uh, uh, now the stuff that gets out there by, 
by being viral. So, um, you know, probably the best example is from a couple of years ago with the Save the Boobs campaign that yeah. uh, that Aaliyah Jasmine was in, or uh, you know, th- so things like that that I think um, actually managed to be seen by an enormous number of people simply because it's cheeky, it's irreverent, something that we don't often see in this category yeah. uh, uh, or in this area, but yeah. that, um, that also quote unquote goes viral. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that would actually have never been able to, uh, we, w- we would have just never been able to get that out to that large a number of people. You know, you wouldn't have gotten um, however many many views on, uh, um, uh, on on YouTube that got. So what I love about that is is uh, the actual tonality of it is is something different than you tend to see um, in the uh, than you tend to see in a category like breast cancer awareness. And yet, uh, you know, it had sort of a cheeky quality. It used a, um, a relatively relatively well-known um, millennial icon to uh, to actually be, be in the commercial itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, without a huge amount of money for media placement, it's an amazing amount of of, um, uh, of people paying attention to this, to this ad and, 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 and learning about this. I actually love that. And that was done, not surprisingly, by Rethink, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, who have a very different approach yeah. to... To, um, to breast cancer. Yeah. And, you know, fundamentally, we're talking about a commercial here uh, that was meant to uh, uh, really be promoting a Toronto-based um, uh, charity event. And somehow this thing became so enormous that they're talking about it on, on um, morning shows in the United States. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see if this, this, this kind of last large question kind of pull in some of the points that we've talked to in terms of um, where you need to be to communicate to these folks, um, the type of investment, how you can collaborate uh, and bring in a millennial into some of the decisions and some of the uh, uh, kind of outputs or channels that you use in the hopes that it kind of connect uh, and can, you know, to your point, expand beyond what a traditional uh, advertising investment would get. So let's, 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 let's say you just got hired uh, uh, by a not-for-profit what are the first three things you would have them do? Well, the first two would be exactly the same thing I would be doing with any other target mm-hmm. range or, or with any other age range mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a target consumer. Okay. I would want to get a really strong sense of what they think their communication objective is, mm-hmm. and I would want to get a really strong sense of what their resources are more than anything else. But then the next thing that I would do is I would uh, try very hard to do whatever research could be done with this particular millennial group. The best thing um, is still to actually have a conversation with this group of people, although increasingly a greater amount of um, uh, uh, quantitative data exists, and it's possible actually to, uh, uh, to, to survey this group or to find out what this group is thinking in a broader sense. But the very first thing is, uh, uh, after, after you assess what the client's actual needs are and what their resources are, uh, the, the very next step always needs to be understanding um, what this group is thinking and what their current environment is. So if there's a communications objective like, um, sorry, or if there's a a business objective like we want to uh, increase our donations and we think that millennials are the way to go, the first thing I would say to a potential client is, or to a a client is, so you've you've given me your objective, you've told me what your resources are, this is a group that simply doesn't feel like it has the money to donate. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, um, this is a group that hasn't been engaged in a donation type environment uh, before. If we want um, money to come out of this group to support your cause or your charity or your not for profit, we need to think of a, um, a, a different plan. Okay. Uh, or let's say what you're actually trying to do is um, uh, create a behavior change, for instance, mm-hmm. with this group. Uh, well, one of the things we would say is, you know, um, by the time you're 35, 40, or 50, you probably have some significant ingrained embedded habits in how you approach a particular, uh, your, your behavior in, uh, um, in this particular area. So I would say, you know, one of the first things we have to understand is what does it mean to try and change the behavior of someone who doesn't necessarily have a habit built in as to what they're doing yet? So for instance, um, uh, you, you know, if you want to, let's say you're, um, I don't know, let's say you're uh, an anti, let's say you're an anti-drunk driving uh, groups 30, okay. 40 years ago, yeah. all of your work had to be to explain to people that uh, the driving that they've been doing with alcohol in their system is a bad idea. Mm-hmm. 
one of the ways dealing with a younger market in this, which would be different, is that they probably actually haven't done an awful lot of driving with alcohol in their system <laughs> yet. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very different yeah. sort of communications message. Yeah. Uh, if you're trying to work in, a, if you're an, an anti-smoking group, uh, again, you know, explaining to a 50-year-old that they shouldn't be smoking when they've done so for 35 or 30 mm -hmm. years, it's very different than talking to a millennial person right now who actually mm -hmm. um, has a, 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 is far less likely to be smoking than any other age group. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 what I find is, is interesting is that um, not-for-profit is, is, is such an interesting area because in general we have organizations that, no disrespect intended, tend to move a little more slowly hmm. than, uh, hmm. than, than for-profit brands that okay. tend to be incredibly okay. responsive to what's happening in the marketplace and also sometimes simply don't have the budget for mm -hmm. um, regular research or regularly updating uh, themselves on how people view them or on how people um, um, are changing in, 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 in general in this uh, um, in, in general, and how they respond to sort of not-for-profits overall. So why, so why that really matters? That millennials tend to move quickly, and they also tend to not again have these sort of ingrained habits. So the first thing to do is to try and find a way to understand how this young person really connects to this category and and and, uh, and what's different about them. We did some work uh, when I was at Ethography, um, actually with Ben Simon Byrne, interestingly enough, the agency I'm now at on the um, anti-smokingstupid.ca campaign. Mm -hmm. And while that technically was with the government and not necessarily a not-for-profit, it's the same kind of area where you're trying to affect a behavioral change without necessarily a business goal. And what was really interesting is that as opposed to having to inform people um, that smoking was bad or trying to uh, get them to understand that secondhand smoke is, uh, is something that they don't want to inflict on other people or any of these things, we came up with this notion of this campaign called Stupid because mm -hmm. when we did research with millennials and asked them what they felt about smoking, mm -hmm. both smokers and non-smokers called it stupid. <laughs> so, you know, we actually realized that we'd raised a generation of young people who, A, were less likely to smoke than yeah. the older generation, and B, if they were, they still understood that this habit was yeah. not, and they didn't yeah. mind you playing that back to yeah. them. Yeah, okay. So instead of trying to make not smoking cool, Mm -hmm. We instead wanted them mm -hmm. to recognize that smoking itself was actually stupid, mm -hmm. and you could actually say that and elevate that conversation. Okay. That's a completely different mm -hmm. form of anti-smoking campaign yeah. that's ever been done with any yeah. adult group. Yeah. But we were able to do it with this generation of young people because we started first and foremost just by talking to mm -hmm. them. And, and talking to this generation with no preconceived notions whatsoever mm -hmm. and, um, and no, uh, no agenda of where we think we might like uh, their thoughts or opinions to go mm -hmm. is, is absolutely step one. Okay. And, um, I'm just going to jump into a couple of quick rapid fire questions, but I like the way you ended it there that you said talking. So I think, you know, be it engaging this audience uh, online. It, it sounds as though what I'm hearing, one of the, the main themes in, in your answers today is that you need to engage these folks uh, in conversation. You need to engage them within your organization, not just your marketing. Am I hearing you kind of right as a general theme in that point? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, as I said, a couple of quick rapid fire questions here. Um, millennials are a homogeneous group. Yeah, they are and they aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, they are actually starting to self-segment themselves okay. when older millennials are looking at younger millennials and recognizing that there are some differences. This is a very nascent thing, so I'm not 100% sure what it's fundamentally going to look like. Yeah. But um, we tend to view millennials sort of, you know, those people who are anywhere from, let's say, 18 to 33 or yeah. so. Yeah. And 28, in the, in the upper end of that, at that age range, 28 plus, 28 is the average age of first marriage now in Canada, 29 mm -hmm. the average age at which we have our first kids. So those mm -hmm. older millennials that, uh, in their mid to late 20s are looking at the younger ones and starting to see there's a large gap in some really fundamental areas of mm -hmm. their lives, marriage, kids, career. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. But where they are very similar is uh, the cultural references, the music that they listen to, the movies they watch, the video games they play, uh, all of the, all of that um, and more is actually very, very similar. Okay. So even though there are these mm -hmm. tremendous life stage mm -hmm. differences, primarily around um, personal agency, responsibility, and uh, and and let, let's say um, adult milestones, for want of a better way to put it, there are enormous commonalities in the channels we use to market to them and the kinds of messages and the tone uh, that they still respond to. Okay. So um, homogeneous, but not. Okay. It's, it's, it's very di it's very difficult. And to yeah. use the cliche, it means that the devil is really in the details. Yeah. Yeah. You need you need to be 
in, in, incredibly connected to what's going on in their culture mm-hmm. and have a deep understanding of the way that this group can be the same but can also be different. So okay. if I were a um, video game marketer, mm-hmm. the fact is, you know, my target is probably, depending on, on, the, on the game, is, you know, guys 13 to 35 with a sweet spot of 22. Mm-hmm. Well, truthfully, in the category like video games, you can market to all of them the exact same way. Yeah. But in a category like uh, okay. like some of the ones we're talking about, mm-hmm. not-for-profit, for instance, mm-hmm. there are going to be massive, massive mm-hmm. differences. Okay. Good clarification. Thank you. Um, one that, that I, I hear and see in, in the, the, the press often, millennials are uh, lazy, self-absorbed, and not interested in being charitable donors. Well, those are um, three separate things. So uh, we can all be lazy. <laughs> Uh, this generation is not actually particularly yeah. lazy. I think it's actually a, 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 a huge, a, a, a hugely sim- overly simplified way mm-hmm. of of taking some very superficial attributes and thinking that it means lazy. But you know, uh, parents have been telling their kids to go out, stop, go outside and 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 stop being lazy since uh, since parents have had kids. So I don't I don't necessarily think that one's totally fair. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as self-absorbed goes, to some extent, yeah. I mean. Uh, that's maybe not the term that I would use, mm-hmm. but certainly this is a generation of young people that has, um, frankly, it, it's it's funny when I hear adults say it because it's a generation of young people that are being told by adults on a daily basis that their opinion matters more than ever before, mm-hmm. that they are allowed mm-hmm. to think about themselves. Um, adults, in fact, pay more attention to what young people are saying and doing, okay. and then copy them. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're getting reinforced all the time that yeah. what you're saying actually matters. The, the, the truth is that, in, in my opinion anyway, young people have always been self-absorbed. Part of being a young person is you're establishing your own identity, and the only way to actually do that is to be incredibly inwardly gazing at some point. Mm-hmm. The difference with this group is that they have the ability to broadcast their self-absorption in a way that never used mm-hmm. to happen. So young people used to keep diaries, for instance, mm-hmm. or journals, and write about themselves and how they were thinking and feeling and doing at length, yeah. or they would go out with their friends and have conversations, or quite famously in the past, we've talked about young people talking on the phone for hours. Yeah. The difference now is that they're able to actually broadcast that. Mm-hmm. So we think that they're more self-absorbed. Mm-hmm. I actually think we are just seeing more of it, but I okay. was no less self-absorbed as a 16-year-old than a typical 16-year-old that I see right now. Yeah. What I will say is that if you gravitate towards that as a young person, you have... Um, because of technology, because of digital, and because of social, you can you can be way more self-absorbed than anybody used to be, and that you you, you know you can focus on yourself a lot. You can ask other people what they think about you. You can communicate to other people what you think about yourself, et cetera, et cetera. But I will say that if you um, lean in a different direction, where you want to affect some change, or do something interesting, or change, uh, or, or invent something, that's also much greater. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's quite fair to say that your typical young person is more self-absorbed without at the same time saying, okay, but um, this is the first time in history that we have as engaged and involved a group of young people who are doing things like quite literally inventing Google or Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know yeah. no previous no previous generation uh, before this one can boast um, as many interesting, engaged young mm-hmm. people uh, creating or inventing things that are, are, are truly transforming their worlds or ours. Right. So I think it's the flip side. I think uh, the fact that millennials understand digital culture so incredibly well and that it's in fact become uh, one of the languages that we all use to, to, to run our lives means that they have a, a bigger impact everywhere. So their self-absorption has become uh, you know, weaponized, for want of a better way to put it, <laughs> but so has their ability to have an impact on the rest of the world. I, I love that one about self-absorbed because you know it's, it's, um, uh, it's amazing to think about the number of um, incredible inventions or developments in the past 15 years that have been created by people who are 30 or under. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, and I mean, you know, there's Facebook and there's Google, but there's, um, you know, Square, the credit card reader that fits yeah. into the top of your phone. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's Napster without which we don't have iTunes. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's, 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 uh, an amazing number of developments. So, it, it, it's, it's. Um, it's extremely easy to dismiss them, yeah. but I think that is uh, a, an incredibly naive thing to do. Good, thank you. And obviously, the reason for raising those questions were to kind of to say that they are are uh, myths, and that not for profit should be paying attention to the fact that they are myths and coming up with programs 
around those those uh, yeah. those those nuts. And I would say that then the larger issue for not-for-profits mm-hmm. is, you know, that being said, this is a generation of young people who don't have an enormous amount of money to donate, mm-hmm. who frankly are probably looking at the typical ways that we engage donors and thinking that none of that really matters to them. It's not what they actually want. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the tax receipt has less of an impact on them because they're, um, uh, you know, if anything, they're, they're, they're not really expecting to, uh, uh, to pay a huge amount of taxes, but also uh, the fact that they're going to be getting money back in eight months is uh, you know for someone who lives in a, uh, um, like a millennial in a much more immediate fashion, yeah. eight months is, is eight months is forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so so um, so all of the things that we typically do, I think, are uh, uh, or that we typically try to do anyway, are in my mind um, just sort of not geared towards this group. If I can quickly use a parallel, what I would say is yeah, we do. often get we often get asked, you know, why don't young people vote if they're so mm-hmm. engaged? Mm-hmm. And I always actually turn that because young people do, you know, vote in, in smaller numbers mm-hmm. proportionally than any other segment of the population. And I always turn that back and I always ask people, why would they? And what I mean by that is you can, uh, you know, if, if, you know, you can vote when you're 18. So let's say on average your, your first election that you get to vote in occurs when you're 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Okay. So by that time, you have left high school. You're probably in university, which um, these days you are probably contributing to pay for yourself. Yeah. You've certainly had a job and paid taxes, meaning that without the ability to vote, you've actually been paying taxes, which means you know, it's the opposite of representation by population. I find that, I find that, uh, uh, that amazing. You can be a taxpayer and not actually be able to vote for your leaders. Mm-hmm. You've uh, been able to drink for at least a year or two, but you've probably been drinking for four or five. <laughs> you've been able to vote. For, you've been able to drive, sorry, for, uh, uh, for four years as well. Yeah. Your parents, who are busier than ever before, have been expecting you to take care of yourself more often, to be self-driven. Uh, you're doing all of these things before you can vote. Yeah. And then someone says, so why aren't you voting? Well, wh- wh- why would I? Yeah. My world has, has, has continued, and I've become a more actualized person who is living like an adult without ever voting. At the same time, no one ever, you know, politically, people really rarely talk about youth issues. They rarely come to young people and sort of on, on their terms. And, you know, we can't actually even vote online yet, which is how they do pretty much yeah, exactly. online. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of actually saying, why don't they? My question is, why should they? And so on the not-for-profits, I would say, traditionally, we have these sort of very adult-oriented forms of communication. We, uh, we, we tend in the, in the industry, not always, but mm-hmm. the industry skews older in that an awful lot of, of not-for-profit happens uh, on, I would argue, adult causes, like diseases or ailments that are going to affect you only mm-hmm. when you're older, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that, so, so, mm-hmm. so that sort of thing. The language of the industry tends to be a little more staid or a little more controlled, which mm-hmm. is sort of not very, not very useful. What I would argue is, is, and then also you've got a group of young people who maybe don't actually actually have that much money. Mm-hmm. That being said, what we've noticed over the past, again, however many years of millennial culture, is that there's a, a much, much, much greater number of young people now who are, uh, who are um, engaged in youthful-oriented not-for-profits that tend to speak to them one way or another. Uh, and a lot of these uh, are being invented by young people. My agency represents a group called Pause for the Cause, which is a, um, um, you know, which is an, uh, uh, an agency for the welfare of animals mm-hmm. that did, uh, that has done a couple of really unbelievably great events in the city of Toronto, mm-hmm. uh, where there's almost no one there who's under 40 years old. <laughs> Because uh, the way the agency uh, chose to market this group and the way the Pause for the Cause worked is they went and found um, Maddie, who is mm-hmm. a coon hound that's on Instagram. Uh, she actually has a book called Maddie on Things. She's this, this dog who looks very stoic and state, and her owner manages to place her on top of things and take photos. Mm-hmm. She has hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram. <laughs> so we actually brought the owner and the dog in and sort of treated them like celebrities and had mm-hmm. them be the special guest of honor at this event and put them in all of our advertising. The advertising has since gone on to which a couple of, uh, win a couple of really great awards. So there's a charity around animal welfare that doesn't feel like mm-hmm. the, you know, the SPCA or the Humane yeah. Society or yeah. whoever that actually markets itself in a way uh, that, that uses millennial culture very strongly and donates its profits to create an endowment uh, to, um, to, uh, at um, Guelph School of Animal Sciences to help um, a fund a scholarship for someone who otherwise couldn't go. Okay, it's been you know it's a charity that's three or four years old, created by dog lovers about um, uh, you know about uh, uh, understanding uh, about sorry about actually affecting change in the way that, that that our animals are taken care of. That markets itself in a very millennial fashion towards millennials, and 
it went from being nothing to being a, a pretty big deal in no time at all. Hmm. So why I would argue it's very important is that like any other business out there, any other category out there, your brand is being subtly eroded hmm. by uh, smaller millennial brands coming and eating at lunch. Okay. And we're going to see that that's going to happen with pretty much everyone across the not-for-profit category if some of our existing MFPs don't find a way to engage with this group. Okay. Well, wonderful insight. Um, you've touched on a number of points, and, and I think our listeners are going to get the sense of, uh, you know, this is a half hour or so, but there's, there's certainly lots more, I think, that you could share with, with, uh, with us and with them. Um, just to close, as I said, we've been speaking with Max uh, Valakit of uh, Ben Simon Byrne. Um, thank you, Max, for your time. My pleasure. And thanks to our listeners for stopping by. As I said, this is the third in the series. We hope that you enjoyed the first three. Please let us know your thoughts and come on back real soon. Bye for now.